That's really cool. Today's Captain's Blog is made possible through the support of Jeremy Jorgensen. If you like what you see and you're into this kind of stuff, check out the links below in the description for the Discord to see how you can get involved and hang out and join the community. Thank you. Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome back to the shop. Today's equipment autopsy is all about the Cavitron Burton Electricator. And this is the thing that Mr. Kidwell and I tried to do a video over the weekend and it failed epically. Train wreck. Because this thing died. Now, we didn't, to be fair, we didn't know if the thing worked or not when we started, but we got into it and was like, oh, well, that is really most sincerely dead, so it's going to be an autopsy. Now, what this is, is an electrical cauterizer device, and it's used for cauterizing wounds. You press the button and high voltage appears on the tip, and, bzzz, and you cook parts of people off. So, yeah. But what it is inside is a high voltage power supply. So I figured we'd check this out and learn about how it works, and that could be kind of fun. So I'm gonna begin by cutting the cords off of this, because we're not powering it up, because I don't want to get electrocuted on camera. That's that's Electro Boom. Watch, watch him, he's good at getting hurt. I'm gonna leave this one still on here, but that gets that off the thing. And let's, I'm gonna to have to come back to those, but we'll, We'll take out the easy and obvious screws and see if that gets us anything. Though I think those screws are just the clamps for the cables coming in the back. Now this thing is probably 70s vintage, judging by the, the color scheme, the look, the feel, the fit, the finish. It's good stuff. It's medical grade, so you know it's expensive. but. It's got that 70s vibe, so we're just going to pick some bits off that are in our way. So immediately looking in the back, we can identify some parts. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these and really dig into them. But just at first glance, we can see we've got a transformer, fuse, terminal strip, a flyback Odin coil thing happening here. Uh, capacitor. This, I think, is a spark gap. We're going to find out. That's clearly a rather hefty capacitor, 1,200 volts. And this is a relay. Old school ice cube relay. Big, chunky thing. And then we've got some lights in there that might predate LEDs. And if they do, that means there are neon lights in there, which would be kind of cool to check out. But yeah, we're just going to dig into this and explore and learn some stuff. And it'll be kind of fun. All right, so where to begin? Let's start simple and just give this a haircut and open things up because we got, we got a lot in here in a very tight space. Oh, wire nuts. I hate wire nuts. Learn about way it goes. So we've got two little wires and two big wires and this goes down to the wand. Now the two little wires are probably the connections for the switch in the the electrode holder but why are there two big wires why two and not just one because this is only one electrode at the tip why do you need four wires huh all right well we're gonna we're gonna cut this off so we can just get it out of the picture and we're gonna come back to that electrode because I'm, I'm removing it intact because I may want to do something with that electrode in the future. Possibly involving a different high voltage power supply. That could be cool. Okay. Wow. We predate zip ties here. Or at least they didn't use zip ties in this. They probably existed at this point in history. And this is this is this is what the world used entirely before zip ties. And some parts of the world still use. If you if you're building projects and you're using wax string to lace your circuits together, then you 
have class. That is, that's artisanship. That's craftsmanship. That's, that's cool. Nobody does this anymore. Like, the telecommunications guys still do. And some aerospace stuff, you'll see a call out for that every now and then. But not, not too much. All right, so we've got a lot of wires on this relay to get out. And I'm just going to, we're just going to separate this out and then go through things piece by piece because it's so densely packed in situ that it's not really easy to demonstrate and talk about. So there's our resistor, or resistor, relay. You can see it's a 115 volt relay, ice cube. There's your part number on it. Hey, are there two coils in that relay? Oh, I'm curious. Okay, we gotta figure that out. Ah, what else we got? We've got the fuse, that's easy to pop out. Where's that wire go? Goes up there. Oh, you can see they bypassed the thing out. That wire goes to that side of the fuse. That wire is just cut off, so you'll come right out. Oh, I don't know that that'll fit through the thing, but I'll try. I don't think it will. Yeah, I think that's in there forever, so I'm just going to trim it down. Because the heat shrink is too big to get through. It's not like I was going to use it again anyway. Okay, so... This wire doesn't do anything. We can just work our way right down this terminal strip. And we'll see what we can play with and explore and take apart. This will be cool. All right, now I can see my big main ground lug over here. We can pull those off. And we're going to cut that on this end because we're not going to use it on the transformer end, but we might hook that up. All right. Well, that's already a fair bit cleaner. And now we can start popping pieces out. I know that's not LED. It might be neon. Is it neon? I don't know. I think it's neon. It might be incandescent, but I think it's neon. It's going to be cool to find out. And now we got to start unscrewing things to get pieces out. So let's start up here with this little capacitor. We go. Oh, it's mounted down to that rheostat. So we'll cut that off and we'll cut that off. And there's our little baby capacitor. That's cute. We got a rheostat in there and a big switch. I disconnect the wire at the rheostat. And we're going to take that cap out. Teflon leads on that. Okay, we'll disconnect off the big switch here. And here. And we'll take our spark gap out. That looks like GTO cable or something similar. Oh, that's totally a spark cap and it's adjustable. That's cool. That is absolutely an adjustable spark cap. Never seen one like that before, but it'll be fun to check out. 
All right, so now we got to get this big coil arrangement out. I don't know if it's like a Odin coil or a flyback transformer. It doesn't look like a flyback, but it might function like a flyback. And you see Odin coils in a lot of high voltage medical devices, especially going back to serious quacktastic days. But if you think the serious quacktastic days are behind us, then you only have to look into a few of the different multi-level marketing scams out there to see that pseudoscience in medicine is still very alive and well. This, not pseudoscience, this is just a basic electrical cauterization device. So it's kind of a gruesome science, but it's not pseudoscience. This is just zapping people with plasma to close up wounds and they use it every day. In fact, there's a lot of people who have had like their vasectomy done this way or they've had some kind of growth removed and they use something like this or the same concept of using electricity to activate a, a cauterizer. Sometimes they're done just straight electricity. Sometimes they're done thermally and uh, they work really well. It's like instant scab. All right. Oh, oh, we got a thing. Got a hanger. Oh, we'll just cut the whole thing right off. What is that, a resistor? It's from India. It's a resistor. Okay, cool. We'll set that aside. That's clearly our ground bus. Medical grade, high voltage. Everything's grounded very well. Okay, so now we're down to a big multipole switch and a rheostat. And I'm going to need Allen wrenches to get that out. All right, so we pop that off, we'll set that aside, and we pop this one off. Now, a lot of stuff like rheostats and switches and stuff, old car radios, all mount via a panel mount through the old post and nut system. So it's a thing to look out for when you're dealing with taking stuff apart or building stuff. Um, you'll see this a lot where things just have a hollow threaded shaft because this shaft moves around inside there. You, you can see that that turns. But this part is threaded and hollow and there will be a pair of nuts and sometimes they're keyed like this. This key goes in a little notch and it keeps this from spinning in the thing. So if you turn the knob, the whole the whole unit doesn't turn, just the part you want. So that's why they have that key. And that's an important thing to remember when you're putting stuff like that together. You'll find this on Alan Bradley switches all the time. So here's another one where we've got the, the same threaded shaft with the two nuts arrangement. And a million years ago, that's how car stereos used to be mounted. If you see an old car stereo that has two knobs like that and then like usually five buttons in the middle the stereo actually mounts under the two knobs there's there's a threaded arrangement like this this is really cool and the first part that we're really going to explore this is a switch now i'm going to cut some stuff off so that we're down to just the raw switch and that'll help this make a lot more sense and I'm going to put the knob back on it. Now, this knob, you can see it's just round in there. It's not like a D-shaped shaft. It's just a round shaft. So to make it work, we have to actually tighten the knob down. And this knob tightens down in two places. There's a little, these are called set screws or sometimes grub screws. And they go in the side of the shaft. You tighten that down there. You tighten that down there. And you just snug it. And now the knob will work, which is way easier than trying to just spin it by the shaft because this has a lot of resistance because that spring right there, this disc here, see this piece of metal? That is what's providing the resistance. 
I'm going to try and get a light on that so you guys can see it a little better. Because Avatech gave me a light so we can do better now. Look at that. Now you can really see it. Oh, it's a whole new world. All right, so we can see this disc here. That's actually a spring. And that spring is pushing down on a ball. And you can see the ball down in here. And the ball falls into dents. And that's what gives the spring, the, the whole switch its chunk. Now, this is a two-position switch. So it's either here or here. So as I move that, you can see the ball come out and push the spring back and then fall into the little divot. So when I go from position one to position two, it does that. And that's how that switch works. And this gives the switch a very positive stop so the switch holds its position where you want it to because while that's happening up on the front, this, this front part controls where the position lands. So, so you can see your arrow there. So we want it to be there and there. And no matter how much I turn it, we're always going to stop there. No matter how much I turn it that way, we always stop there. And it doesn't want to end up anywhere in the middle. It's, it's one of those. You can make it go in the middle, but it's really clear to anybody operating the switch. It's A or B. And that's because of the divots down in here. And, and we have two balls falling into two divots. You can see there's one little ball there and then one little ball here. So it's balanced either side. So we've got that. This is the mechanical part of our switch. This is the, the heavy lifting part. Okay. Now we can also see here we've got an insulated shaft and a metal shaft. So the metal part is the, the strong, raw, takes a lot of force and abuse. And then there is this fiber part that's the insulator and it's pinned together through a little joint, like a little clevis joint. And it comes out back here and the insulated shaft moves this disc. Now the disc is insulated and then there's these metal contacts out here which look pretty corroded and oxidized and kind of ugly. But as we turn the switch to, through its positions, and now with just that, we know everything that's happening back here. Okay. So we know that these are the commons here because those are always touching. And let's say that's, okay, so we'll say that's off and that's on, okay, because it's just two states. We know these are the normally open conductors. So the two red ones are normally open. These two are common and these two are normally closed. We know that we have a double pole because there's two different sets of contacts. There's these three here and these three here. And we have a double pole, double throw switch because we can have it here or here. If we didn't have these two contacts, this would be a single throw switch because it would just open or close. But with this, we're open here, but we're closed here. So we've got a set of normally open and normally closed contacts, and then we've got our commons. So this is this wiper rides on the armature. We've got our little, our little disc, and that controls this. And then we've got these stator contact points and these are little spring pieces and this slides under it. And you can see that as this moves around, it slides under the spring and makes an electrical connection. Also, that would probably arc pretty good when it's operating. That'd be kind of neat to see. So that's our switch. Next up, another little we have to put it together to make it work right thing. Now this is from the Omite Manufacturing Company in Skokie, Illinois. 
and they've been in business forever and they make resistors of a variety of types. This particular resistor is what's called a rheostat. And by changing the position of the wiper, and for those of you who are fans of my work and have seen a lot of Variac in these videos over the years, this will very closely resemble a Variac, but it's not. Even though we've got a core with a winding and an armature that only makes contact on the edge, and we've got a connection at this end of the winding and this end of the winding and one in the middle. It ain't what you think. First, let's look at some differences right away. These two are soldered together, so this only connects here to here. And that winding changes size. See how it's tiny wire down here and a medium wire here and then a really big wire over here? It changes size as it goes around. We start out really tiny and we end up really big. The wire is a resistive wire, okay, like nichrome wire or something like that. When you put electricity through this wire, it converts some of that electricity into heat. So this actually gets pretty hot in use, which is why the shell up here is made out of ceramic. This inner core isn't a bunch of steel laminations. That's a ceramic cord that the wires wound around. And this is designed to run hot. So this, we look at how it's wired. Now we know that this contact goes through to the armature. And we know that this contact is the end of the wire on this end, and this contact is the end of the wire on this end. So right here, when we, when we use this in circuit, we're gonna connect between here and here, or either of these, it doesn't matter because they're bridged. So let's say we connect between here and here. At this point, we have maximum resistance between here and here. And if we turn the knob and go that way, now, since we're going in here and jumping right up to the armature, through, down, and out, we're not putting any electricity through the windings, and this is all, there's, there's no resistance to it. And we can meter this out to prove it. Let's do that. All right, we're back. We have our potentiometer. These are frequently referred to as POTS, just so you know. And I'm going to connect our ground lead on that side and our hot lead on that side. And we'll take these over to the meter. And with a little movie magic, I can set this up so that you guys can read the meter and see how we move the thing and do it like that. And that'll be pretty cool. So here, we'll set the meter out here. That's set to ohms. Okay. And I'll hold this here so we can see it move. Now, I said that at this point, we would have the minimum ohms, right? And we can see on the meter we're at 0.35 ohms. So as I move this up, that number should go up. Hey, look at that. And all the way at max, we have 74 ohms, 74.07 ohms. And when we read the side of this, it says right here, 75 ohms. So see, it works. And if I turn this down and we see the armature move the other direction, we can see the meter go down there. So up gives us more ohms, down gives us fewer. And that's all because we're forcing the electricity to go around this path and that's turning, it, it's adding more wire, more distance, more resistance, and more heat to the system. So this, the more you crank that over, the hotter it gets. But at only one amp, it's not, it's not going to get terribly hot. For bonus points, work out the numbers, do this in the comments, for the volts and amps 
given the resistance being 75 ohms maximum. Okay, so now that we've mapped out the resistance numbers on this at the top and bottom, what would the amperage be assuming the same voltage? What would, how would the voltage change? How would this change as you put power through it? What could you use this for? Could you use this for a light switch? Could you use this for a volume knob? Could you use this to control a motor or a servo or something like that? What are common applications of a rheostat, a variable resistor? in the real world. All right, so here we have a capacitor. Now it's tiny, but mighty. You can see where it says 1200 WVDC. That means volts direct current, usually working volts direct current. So 1200 volts, which is a lot. And we've got 0.01 microfarads. So it's a tiny capacitor, but mighty. These are the terminals to it. We're going to take those off. So that's the terminals on the cap, is those brass screw fittings on the end. Now the casing on this is Bakelite. Bakelite is like plastic from back in the day. And it isn't used so much anymore. You can still find it in some places. And we've got, yeah, that's old. They still use this stuff too. That's a phenolic resin. So this tells us this cap is old. I don't know what we're going to do with it. But I'm going to hold on to it because it's kind of cool. And I'm currently tinkering with some very old technology because I'm getting set up to build a vacuum tube Tesla coil. And this might be useful for that. So I'm going to actually save this part for the vacuum tube Tesla coil. So there you have a capacitor at 0.01 microfarads, 1200 volts DC, and it gives us a part number. But a quick Google search doesn't come up with anything for that part number, so God knows how old this is. No other markings on it at all. So for our next part, we have a spark gap. I'm holding on to this because I want to fire it up and make it work, and I don't have any high, voltage, high enough voltage power supplies at the moment to play with this, but there's two air gaps here, now, the gaps, the actual gaps, I need a pointer. The actual gaps, one of them is right here, and then that's an insulator, and one of them's right here, and that's an insulator, and this is an adjustable spark gap because by turning this screw, that pushes against this insulator and opens up this gap, just like turning on this screw pushes against this insulator and opens up this gap. And then we've got these insulators here that don't move, but you connect clearly one wire on this brass plate here, and then the other wire connects here on this brass plate. And then in the middle, this is how you mount it to your preferably well-insulated centerpiece. And yeah, this would actually work as a really small, really simple spark gap for a small Tesla coil that you'd probably want to blow some air on it to help quenching. But you could actually use this for a tiny Tesla coil. When we're keeping that. So here we've got a transformer made by McCarran. There's your part number. can't get any real data on it so let's see what we can learn about this transformer just from examining it okay okay well right off the hop we know it's a high voltage transformer because this one wire is crazy thick 
And uh, let me see if I can get a cleaner cut of that for you. There you go. That looks, that's a lot easier to see. We see a little tiny wire wrapped in a whole lot of really big plastic. And then there's another outer plastic thing. And it's red for danger. So this is a high voltage wire. That's called GTO cable. You'll see this a lot in neon signs. And that comes off this winding. So we know that this is our secondary winding here. And our secondary has the high voltage lead and then the ground. They're doing some current limiting through this resistor. Now the other side, we've got just two wires, so it's really simple. This is our low voltage side. We don't know what that low voltage is, but it's probably 120 volts. So we have a high voltage transformer right here that has a little bit of current limiting to it through this resistor. Now this resistor is rated 1.8 kilo ohms, 1.8 K, and then the, the ohm symbol. It's a Clard or Glard? I don't know if that's a C or a G. VC5E, 1.8 kilo ohms, 3 Bravo 137, made in India. So that's a nice little high voltage power supply. Probably, I'm going to say 1000 volts, maybe two. Not a whole lot. And then we've got this dingus, and this I don't know. This, it looks, it looks like an tr air core transformer. We've got two windings. Do we have two windings or do we have one winding with four taps? Oh wait, there's another little winding down on the inside. So we've got this outer winding, which may be one or two windings. And then there's an inner winding that we can see down in there. You can see the glint of copper up in there. And there's a little thin wire coming off right here. Feels like an Odin coil. It's got that vibe of an Odin coil. And that's what I that's what I'm going to guess it is, but that's absolutely a guess. And if you know better, let me know. Feels like an Odin coil. And now we're into a relay. Now this is cool because this relay is old enough that I can open it up pretty easily, I think. Let's see if we can get the cover right off of it. Oh, Bakelite phenolic crap. If that doesn't cure nostalgia, I don't know what will. All right, let's see if we can knock the whole thing right out of here. Assuming it isn't rigid. Yeah, that's what we wanted. Okay, so this is what we know. It's an Alco isolation relay, model FR105. 115 volts contact, max load is 7 amps. Now we can see on here, they, they give us a nice little schematic. So our main coil is black and white. And that can, okay, what's this? So the coil is black and white, but black and blue connect? And what's up with yellow? So now let's look into it and we see we have two coils. So we've got black, yellow, other yellow. So the two yellows are this, this front coil here. The two yellows are this, this coil. And that's our armature. And our armature moves. It's just a single pull, single throw arrangement. Now, I am not a master of relays, but this is interesting. And 
at first blush, I'd want to think that the second winding opens the relay, but I don't know if it works that way. I genuinely don't know, but somebody smarter than me does, so comment, teach us about this. This is, this is a funny looking relay. It could be like a flip-flop thing. It's not latching. My first thought was it was going to be a latching relay. It's not. It doesn't, because it doesn't stay. When, if you, if you have a relay and you push a thing down and it stays, it's, it's, it's a mechanical latching relay. This doesn't do that. Huh. Yeah, one of you guys are going to have to figure that out. Comment in if you know. All right, so the next thing, and our last, is these two lights. And I want to see if they're neon or not. So we're going to open one up and explore it. And then throw some angry pixies across it and see what happens. So I'm just going to lever my way into here. And hope we don't break anything in the process. Because these are crimped over. So let's just... Rar oh, yeah, that's neon. That's so totally neon. Cool. You don't, these have been largely replaced by LEDs. You can still find them now and then, but it's, it's increasingly rare. Look, there's a little, so as we, we, we pull the tube out and we've got two leads, they're rock simple. And down inside there, we can see a little current limiting resistor wired in series with the light. And I'm gonna put this on a stand and turn out the lights and let you guys get a good look at this because this is so cool. So the first thing we gotta do is let's strip the wires so we can hook it up. We'll grab a couple test leads and do some absolutely 100% super OSHA compliant stuff Okay, so now we're all trussed up there. And I'm going to grab this plug and I had a pair of test leads a little bit ago. Ah, these are what I need. Clip that on there, that on there. We'll clip these on our cord. And then we'll plug it in and see if we can make it light up. Oh, that is so cool. Let's turn the lights out. You guys can get a better look at this. Check that out. So what this is, is the same process as like how a Nixie tube works. That's an actual neon light and it's really old and worn out. It's, it's certainly not happy anymore. And you can see the glow around the electrodes. That glow that you're seeing is actually plasma. That's really cool. And that really awesome little glow concludes our autopsy. I'm going to break this other one open so that we can get an even better look inside it. And uh, you guys can just enjoy that. That's so cool. And uh, I will see you guys next time. So thank you for hanging out with me for this equipment autopsy. 
if you get in the, in, the, in the description below, you'll notice there's a link to Discord. Get in there and you can be one of the cool people hanging out with me while I do these videos, while I actually shoot them. And we work together to try and make the videos even better. And it's just a fun place to hang out and you get to hang out in a shot because, well, you get to see this finished video of just a few minutes. We're hanging out all day doing stuff like this and you're welcome anytime. There's no set schedule to it. You just drop in and if we're doing stuff, cool and whatever. And there's, there's autopsies and there's robots. That's the next thing I'm going to work on today. It's just a fun place to hang out and you're all invited. Thank you for hanging out and exploring this stuff. And man, if that isn't the best finish ever, I don't know what. That is, that's the best finish I've ever had on an autopsy. That's really cool. So I'm going to keep playing with this for a little bit and give these dogs cookies because they're starving to death. Hi. Where's the other dog? Hi, other dog. You guys have fun. I'll see you next time. This is a fucking long shoot. I don't want to hear your fucking cell phone ring because I will grind your bones to pulp, reconstitute it into fucking Pringles and snack on you on Thursdays. Sync for camera one. Sync for camera two. Should probably fucking turn on camera three. So this is the Electricator autopsy shot on November 11th, 2019. Time is 14. The fucking, what?